Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part six of Kerbal Spaceships, our serious business, and we are crawling ourselves slowly mm -hmm. into space. We have an option here for a suborbital space flight from Real Shoot. They want me to go up 128 kilometers with an unfortunate or fortunate pioneering mm -hmm. soul mm -hmm. inside this spacecraft. Uh, what else do we have? Rockamax, they are looking for sustained flight in a straight line. That's not gonna work. Uh, what else do we have? Science data from space. Well, if we can go a couple of kilometers higher than 128, then definitely we can collect data from space. So, yeah, all we're gonna do is take the spacecraft we previously designed and take it a little bit higher. We've made some changes to it. The X-1 hull, which uh, has been proven so reliable as a manned vehicle, even if it's incredibly unstable and is likely to kill the owner. Um, yeah, we've uh, added a reaction control system to it and renamed the whole thing Aquador. I've no idea what that name means. It comes from namingschemes.com. It's in a list of tools used by spy agencies. And so, Arcady Zimmerman is on the job, ready to head into space on board this uh, upgraded Red Wing. Now, one of the nice things with real solar system is you have this uh, pumps, you have fuel pumps fitted into every single uh, launch clamp, which means I can throttle up the engine, let the combustion stabilize, let the throttle get to 100% before actually launching. So look what happens, this is the tank. And when I ignite, the fuel stops draining from it until the clamps are released. At which point, of course, we head skywards, accelerating very rapidly on that RD-103 engine, fueled by ethanol and liquid oxygen. This will take us higher and faster than anyone has ever gone before. Prepare for stage separation, and engine firing. There we go. Now, we need to get this thing up to about 128 kilometers minimum. We have a brand spanking new reaction control system fueled by nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas, because if you remember, as we got higher and the air got thinner, eventually we began, began to pitch up because the lack of air in the control surfaces meant there was nothing to counteract the natural pitch that was getting induced by the offset center of mass. Now you can see it firing, but uh, my nose is coming up. My nose is coming up, so I'm going to throttle my engine down, hoping that I can get to 128. That's us at 128. Uh, we're starting to go over. 130 is the next goal. 130, that is us into space. I'm throttled down almost as low as I can. Now, the engine that was used on the X-1, it wasn't really throttleable. What they had was they had four combustion chambers and they could you know, fire one to four of them, giving them basically 25, 50, 75, or 100% thrust. I hear that uh, Chuck Yeager was actually well qualified to operate the rocket engine because uh, his father was in the oil business, or had he'd grown up around his father, and so he kind of knew his way around valves containing very volatile, high-pressure contents, things like that. Anyway, look, we get above 128, we get to 130, we collect data, we send it back, and we get a whole bunch of contract completes, and now we're falling back. This is where it gets really dangerous, because if this thing goes nose first, we may not be able to pull out of the dive. So the main challenge here is to keep the nose up as long as possible. You'll also notice I was unable to correct the roll. That's because the uh, thrusters I put in the wingtips, I accidentally set to use plain old nitrogen, which doesn't work in this case. Okay, we're passing 90 kilometers. I can feel the engine, I feel the, the nose starting to come down. As soon as the atmosphere really kicks in, I'm gonna start firing the engine. There we go. Look, we can't counteract that, so the engine comes in. I don't want to go nose first. In fact, ideally, I want this thing to go as side on as possible. If this thing goes backwards, then it will wobble. So I'm flipping this around like this. I, you know what, I'm just going to let this naturally flip because that way it'll take a lot longer to end up stably 
in whatever configuration. This is an intentional spin because I do not want it there. Oh, look, the nose is starting to snap around. The thing is stable. 50 kilometers and we're starting, we're heading down faster and faster. Of course, it doesn't help that the engines are firing. Okay, yeah, I think, come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, we're not gonna be able to pull out of this. So now we're moving down at 1.3 kilometers per second. Let's roll this into a spin. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Excellent. Notice the high G-loading. That is slowing us down. A lot of that G-loading is slowing our vertical speed. Uh oh Hitting the crew G-limit. Let go of the buttons. Let go of the controls. Just let it naturally damp itself. Okay, apparently naturally damping is not working. Uh, at least it is slowing down. It, we are about to go subsonic. Those control surfaces should really start to bite now. There. Look. Come on. Come on. Don't fail me. Come out of this dive. Yes. Yes. It, oh, wow. In the simulations, I lost like three of these spacecraft to a direct dive like that. But this was successful. We knew how to do it. We tested this maneuver and Arcade Sir, whatever his name is, was able to successfully complete it. Now, of course, no real spacecraft would use a re-entry technique like that. The deliberate spin, the deliberate corkscrew to slow it down is not very kind to the pilot. No, because we have actual technology. We would think about this thing a little more. But uh, I thought it would be fun to continue working with my X1 clone and just see how ridiculous I can make its flight characteristics. The good news is I still have plenty of fuel to bring it back to base. Not that it really matters, but it's nice all the same to take it back as close as it will let us. And indeed, as it happens, I had more than enough energy to get myself to the runway. And, uh, well, I made a decent attempt to land on the runway, but wasn't quite as accurate as I would like. Notice the reaction control thrusters were trying to bring the nose down. Still haven't quite got the correct center of mass for that parachute. And indeed, for the next iteration, it was decided that they want to take those that parachute, split it into two and put one on either side of the body, hopefully reducing the tendency for the whole spacecraft to tilt up. Did I say spacecraft? Well, I guess it is finally a spacecraft. Of course, the, the real-life X-1s never went to space. Only the X-15s made it to space. But I, I will point out that the early X-15s were actually powered by the same engines that powered the X-1. So, you know, there is a sort of lineage there. I'm just, you know, obviously advancing things a few years early. So, yes, got research, got reputation. Tons of reputations. We got suborbital spaceflight, 128 kilometers. We have science data, we have crude altitude records and speed records, and uh, we should probably figure out what else we can do for money. So, um, for now, we, the, lunar, the lunar contracts are probably out of reach, they're technically probably within reach, but I don't know, I might go for it. We have suborbital spaceflight, but now they've raised the bar to 250 kilometers, so I'm not going to be able to repeat this mission anytime soon. Early avionics will be ready in 63 days, and frankly, I think the, the scientists need a bit of help. Because each of these gets researched one at a time, so there's 140 days after that, so that's 200 days before I get supersonic flight, and then solid rocket motors two years out, so I... I'm spending some money on buying points or upgrades. We're going to spend some more time doing R&D. So now we've dropped the time down to 49 days. That's excellent. So a number of people asked me if I could look at some of the other launch sites because I'm just concentrating on American. Well, we have Baikonur and Yasni and everything here. But, you know, Baikonur is the classic, so let's go with that. It is in the middle of Kazakhstan. I believe it was originally called Tirtam, and I probably mispronounced that, but they called it Baikonur to, in communiques or whatever, to hide its real location. I could be completely wrong on that, but never mind. So we have Icarus. Icarus is the product of the new avionics program, and it is a lot lighter than my previous orbital spacecraft, and a lot more capable. We will maintain control longer and higher 
and hopefully we shall be able to actually take this to space and to orbit and collect new data. Now our previous launcher was a massive 40 tons. We were right up against the limit of what was possible with the technology, but early avionics has unlocked much more slimmed down, lighter and fancier control systems, which we will exploit to bring us all the way into orbit. This thing here is about 25 tons. It's using the RD-103 engine, so which is appropriate because, of course, we're launching from uh, Russia. Uh, we have, it's like a three, four stages, I think. Yes, we have two main stages, and then we have a couple of solid rocket stages. Throttle up and go, and this thing accelerates way faster. This is much higher thrust to weight ratio. It's a Soviet rocket designed uh, based on a German design. It uses ethanol and liquid oxygen. Now, you'll notice that I am going slightly northeast rather than straight up east. There's a reason for this. Now, I, I primarily want to get this thing onto an orbit which will cover as many of the zones as possible, so I do actually want to go north. But more realistic, or more relevant to reality, uh, from Baikonur, they actually can't launch directly eastwards. Otherwise, the spent stages will fly over uh, China and, and land in China somewhere. And, you know, it's bad enough that China occasionally drops bits of its own rockets on its own people, but for another country to drop bits of rockets on its neighbours probably doesn't go over particularly well. So. Baikonur Cosmodrome is about a 45 degree latitude, which means that in theory, if you launch directly east, then you would get into roughly a 45 degree inclination orbit. But the space station, International Space Station, is in a 51 degree orbit because that is the lowest inclination, I believe, that is achievable from uh, by launching from Baikonur. I'm exaggerating this quite a bit, but that's okay because I just want to cover as much of the Earth as possible. And we're ready for our first stage. There we go. Engines. And there we go. I'm not sure I actually need those solid rocket boosters, but it does it does look nice the way they separate the spacecraft. And of course now it's time for some super high speed while we fly into space. So you'll notice that I'm using something, it's something new in the toolbar. Next to MJ there is a flashing star. That is science alert, it's telling me that I have all sorts of new science available to me. Uh, and apparently I wasn't paying attention to it. But science alert basically creates like a little flashing reminder to say, hey, you might want to do some science so you can get all the sciencing that you can, you know, need. There we go, flying up there. Actually, you know, now I look at it, it says my inclination is 51 degrees, so this may... <laughs> I thought I was exaggerating when I did this, but it it it, it is, does appear that I'm actually pretty close to reality here. So we want this engine to burn out roughly when my time to apoapse is measured in, you know, less than 30 seconds or so. And then at that point we will fire these little baby sergeant motors. So this is a two-stage baby sergeant setup. We have uh, three of them which will fire. There we go. And those actually have a little bit of angle on them so that we will pick up spin. Because if you hit any pitch or yaw during that separation, adding the roll will ensure that your velocity vector remains roughly the same. Okay, so that's those three down. We're just gonna appreciate the sun rising for a moment before we shatter the piece with another little rocket motor. And just wait for the camera to go nuts, and the camera goes nuts. The camera goes nuts, and we are now in orbit. We have this spacecraft. So this is the X-ray, uh, I don't know, experimental core. It's not the Sputnik core, because this one is lighter. Yeah, okay, um, inclination 50 degrees. So that is actually lower inclination than the space station. But that's actually a pretty good guess that I just totally randomly guessed at what orbit I would need and that ended up being correct. So anyway, we are going to make the most of this. We're going to fly this around the Earth and collect science wherever is possible. Science alert will trigger when it finds new and cool things. I've bound everything to action groups. There we go, we got some more science there. 
And sometimes we get, there's Japan there, another uh, nation which regularly sends stuff to the space station. Obviously, they don't have problems with the inclination. You see, this is fundamentally, when you're launching from Earth, the higher your latitude, the latitude you have specifies the minimum inclination. But you can always increase your inclination if you launch from lower altitudes. That means the best place to launch from is the equator because you have the most options there. More science! We have lots of science. Uh, unfortunately, this will take some time for us to actually utilize everything. Anyway, having collected a, a harvest of science from space, it's time for us to really think about what's going to go next. Now, these are the, these are even better avionics units. The basic construction, well, the problem with basic construction is most of the stuff is RP0 no cost, which means it's not officially part of realistic progression zero. Basic orbital rocketry, basic solids will be coming, we own everything there. Survivability is important because it adds heat shields and you need survivability, stability slash early probes and basic construction if you're going to get that crew capsule. I do not think I should be using the X1 capsule for much longer because it is really reaching the limits of its survivability. So we're going to need each of these things to be researched. So I might as well just add these things to the list. So basic avionics, uh, or no, survivability, early probes. Ooh, that's a whole bunch of new tech that we should add. 20 science, that's going to take a long time. Basic construction, let's add that to the list, even although there's nothing on there that's technically part of this. And I have 30 science left. How best to spend my 30 science? Should I unlock these capsules? Or is there something more useful elsewhere? High-speed flight. Ooh, fancy jet engines and things like that. They are very tempting because I quite enjoy flying planes. Uh, basic capsules. Uh, 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 this is... What else do I have? Oh! Oh, improved instrumentation! Ah, solar panels! Now that is actually something that I want. So we're going to give up on manned space flight until we actually have solar panels to keep them alive in space. But we'll find that in future episodes. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.